And, you know, I was doing Apollo 13. And uh, that was one where I really wasn't out there very much because I had to do the original, the initial bid, bidding and budgeting. And then I had to track, I tracked all my costs with all, all the guys, you know, because I did all the time cards and the petty cash and all that kind of stuff. So I, I was really getting further from construction. I, don't, I didn't do anything on Apollo. And Les Ecker was my crew chief, and Les was doing the day-to-day -day dealing with the guys. I go and look and see what's going on, but I got to get back and do paperwork. And so that was not as fun, certainly. That was, that was more administrative. I was really excited about Apollo 13 because it was a dream job for me. I, I'm, I've always been passionate about the space program and especially the Apollo program and I lived through that whole period you know, fully aware of what was going on and really excited about it. So for me it was a dream job because here I got to actually build no-nonsense duplicates, replicas of that stuff and, they, and I wanted it to be right. So I did a lot of research and it turns out that the curator of the historical archives in Houston of NASA's Apollo program is a model nut. So when, he, when I talked to him and I told him, well, we're making miniatures for this movie called Apollo 13, which he was aware of, he was so excited and he was so kind. He sent me a huge package of information, stuff that had never left Houston before. There were copies, but it was still amazing information. And I read every word of it and just knew it all you know, by rote because it was just so cool. So I was um, very careful with all the detail in that. And, and there were a couple of mistakes, mostly because I, wasn't, I didn't catch them in time. But uh, it was pretty accurate. We uh, had to figure out how to shoot them and how to rig the, these miniatures for motion control. And a lot of the shots were very challenging rigging. And this is all the kind of sort of ephemera that really doesn't live beyond the project. But we really achieved some amazing motion control shots with that film that, that were major engineering debacles to, to actually pull off with cleanliness. In motion control, if your model deviates a fraction of an inch from take to take or position to position or different lightings which means different temperatures your elements won't line up with each other and they can't be used so your miniatures have to be very stiff very stable through temperature changes and get lit properly in a number of different conditions sometimes even with black light uh, fluorescent paint usually invisible paint it's really exotic stuff, and, and so that's what makes that kind of model making so challenging. Motion control model making is a whole other category of challenging in terms of the craft. So we, uh, we completed all the work finally, and it was very challenging. The, the shoot schedules were just brutal. So we finally finished it up, and, and that was a, a really satisfying experience because of the historical importance of the film, telling a story that people really didn't know all that well, and telling it very well, I thought. So I came in sort of toward the tail end because they had let a bunch of people go and then a bunch of shots came back. They needed more shots and so they had to beef up the crew again. And so I came in on that second wave. Joining with Joe Viscosal, he did the pyrotechnics on that. Um, let's see, one of the projects I worked on was uh, the re-entry sequence with the uh, capsule. We had a real nice quarter scale capsule that they had already built, but we had to build a second one for the, uh, the pyro element. And uh, with motion control, you know, we're able to, to marry various elements together. So we built the same shape and size just out of uh, sheet steel. We hung it up in the air so the camera could look up at it. You know, there's a black behind it because everything's shot on black in this case. Uh, and we shot, I think it was two second frames, which is really long for a shot, and uh, to, to get that motion blur of the flames and brought them up very slowly over about a 16 minute shot. So it was a very slow process and uh, burned the heck out of that heat shield. Every time we'd have to pull it, it'd come out really warped and we'd have to pull it back off and put another one on and had a smell that, uh, terrible smell that was all over digital domain for the next year or two. You know, uh, couldn't walk through that without smelling it. And it looked beautiful. And then we uh, had another element that we used for that. I had to airbrush the bottom of another heat shield uh, with fluorescent paint. So it would glow kind of an orange fluorescent paint, ramping up the, the light on that so that, uh, you know, in digital they could sit there and pulsate it and give it some, some variation. But uh, we gave them the range of uh, brightnesses. And uh, there's a lot of just feeding elements into the digital pipeline at that point. Oh yeah, and the shot of the, uh, the Saturn V lifting off. A lot of effects were going into this, and Les Ecker was really involved in coming up with some of the, uh, the uh, specific trickery, uh, such as the ice, that, the sheets of ice that come off as, as the Saturn V is lifting off. Um, 
by frosting up a piece of sheet metal and just hitting it with a little hammer and uh, causing the sheets to come off and photographing that. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, there's that one impossible shot, I guess, where the, the, you see the camera going down through the gantry and the little arms are swinging away as the rocket's starting to lift off. And uh, just, uh, we had to rig up all these little motors on there, little stepper motors. So, and it was, all, it was all shot on the side so that the camera could easily get through there in that path. So all these motors had to pull up these arms one at a time and, and it was all, again, controlled by the Cooper system. Apollo 13 had a lot of challenges uh, because we had fire with the miniatures when we were doing a launch sequence, how to achieve that effect of the, the, uh, the launch with the fire coming out and kind of appearing to be sucked back in. That's it's quite a challenge to make a miniature that can hold up. We actually shot that thing about 14 times. So you had to, it basically had to be a fireproof model that you couldn't, you couldn't light up no matter what you did to it because uh, we made a pretty big fireball around it. The thing with, with digital uh, models, and, and there are some pretty amazing ones and some that quite fool you, is that um, they are illustrations. So they're really only as good as the illustrator. And uh, with a model, it, is, it does become a three-dimensional object. So uh, yes, I mean, you know, skill level and how to produce that and make it look realistic is one thing, and then also how to film it. But it just tends to have uh, what they call that uncanny valley thing, you know, where, where your, your mind knows that that's a real object versus an illustration. And um, uh, that's why, I mean, I think that the, the best films today are the ones that combine miniatures and digital to combine them with both because you can do things in the digital world that you cannot do physically no matter what you do. Uh, they'll never really work right and you can kind of, you can kind of massage them or, or, or work them out so they will work. And for me it was a real blessing. It was a huge gift and again my gratitude comes out full force because I, I was nominated, I was put on the list for nomination for the Oscar and we were nominated uh, and um, that was really thanks to Pat McClung. You know, thanks to Pat, because Pat told me, he said, well, I don't, I don't actually agree with Pat, but he said, you did all the work, and it's not true. Of course it's not true, but that's Pat. He's a very generous human being. And in fact, he'd just been nominated the season before for True Lies, which was pretty cool. So he said, no, I've been nominated, you, it's your turn, you know, go ahead. So they put me on the list, I couldn't believe it, because really, I, I saw myself as just a model maker, you know, it wasn't really a key on the project. But what actually happened, that project evolved into a, an interesting challenge for me in another way, and that is that because of my research, I knew every detail about that rocket. The whole rocket, the mission, the way things look. I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable in terms of physics, and so I, I knew a lot about astrophysics. So when they had, they had us coming to dailies, and they wanted us to just come up with stuff we saw, you know, if we had any notes. And so I would often comment that, well, it doesn't really look that way. You know, that rocket is a hypergolic rocket and the engine, the, the, the exhaust plume is this color and this size and it just doesn't look like that. Well, what they did was they decided to make me the, the accuracy cop and the, the space physics authority on the job. So I would literally write textbook pages. I remember I wrote a textbook page for the artists because they needed to know what urine would look like and how it would beha behave when it was ejected from a spacecraft in the vacuum of space, when lit by the sun, because that makes a difference in space. And so I did. <laughs> and it was, it's interesting because it doesn't do what you think it's going to do, and so it won't look like you think it's going to look. And it's always more interesting to see the fact of it in these exotic situations, because it's so unexpected. So I guess partly because of that um, influence on the project, they decided to put me on the list, and so we were nominated. We ended up losing to the movie Babe, which was a really interesting situation. But that's a whole other story because it's about um, the process of nomination and award in the Academy. In Britain, the process is reversed. In the US, the educated body of the Academy nominates and the whole body votes on the award. In England, it's the opposite. The whole body votes on nomination, which I think is good because everybody knows when stuff looks good. But only the educated people in the visual effects branch vote on who actually wins the award, which I think makes a lot of sense because um, those are people who really know what it took to do the work and they understand what's being, what's being described. Uh, and so in England, we actually won the, the Academy Award for Apollo 13. 
And I couldn't be there to accept the award because I was working on something else. I think it was Titanic or something. But Mark Stetson was working on Fifth Element. I guess it was Fifth Element I was working on. But Mark was in London supervising the visual effects for Fifth Element for Digital Domain. And so he went to the ceremony and accepted the Oscar in, in lieu of our being able to go. I don't think anybody else could go. And that's so cool. It's so perfect because you know, I owe so much gratitude to Mark. And I was so happy that he could do that. It's really fun.